it's, thank you. It's actually not two Bibles, it's a book and a Bible. It is kind of disheartening that the book is bigger than the Bible. <laughs> anyway, is this yours? Okay. Don't know what that was, but or is, but anyway. Good evening. Are you all excited to be in church tonight? Are you just excited to be? <laughs> and Courtney, you can't wrap yourself with a bow and have that as the Mother's Day. <laughs> I don't think they need marriage counseling, Pastor Larry. No, they do. <laughs> Already did. I do now. <laughs> Gold. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is what church should be all about, right? No, not that. Having fun. We got a license for that. <laughs> you can't steal my lines, Courtney. All right. Okay. <laughs> Last week we introduced, I'm just going to stick to my notes right now. Last week we introduced uh, um, our mini-series, Practical Discipleship. And, and I, I pointed out a verse in Matthew 28, verse 19 that says, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always. Now, the thing that I really stressed last week was, go and make disciples. Now, these were disciples who were commanded, right, by Jesus to make disciples. You see, it's not just enough to be a follower of Christ. God actually put the mandate on you to then go and make other followers of Christ. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And notice it didn't say go get people saved. It didn't say go get people baptized. Right? It said make disciples. And so that's kind of the basis of our practical discipleship. We're not defining, we're not, well, I guess we'd spend a little bit of time defining practical discipleship, but if you want to know more about discipleship, you can go back. We've done several series, ser series, several series on that subject, but t tonight we're continuing talking about practical. And last week we spent our session defining what practical discipleship is. And just as a form, a way of review, we said that true discipleship Discipleship is a disciple that makes disciples. We also said that practical discipleship is sowing the seeds of God's word into other people. We, ought, we said that practical discipleship is staying attached to the vine. And we find that in John chapter 14. And practical discipleship produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. According to Galatians chapter 5. And practical discipleship dies to our desires to live for God's desires. Right? And tonight we're going to move on, but I want to add one more to our definition of what practical discipleship is. And really it's going to be the transition, the turning point into what I want to speak about tonight. And that, the last one I want to add to that list that I, that I just read is de defining what practical discipleship is. Is practical discipleship is a verb. What is a verb? Action. That's right. James chapter 2 says, So then, faith that doesn't involve action is phony. But someone might object and say, One person has faith and another person has works. Go ahead then and prove to me that you have faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works as proof that I believe. You can believe all you want that there is one true God. That's wonderful. But even the demons know this and tremble with fear before him, yet they're unchanged. They remain demons. O oh, feeble sons of Adam, do you need further evidence that faith divorced from good works is phony? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham found righteous before God because his works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Can't you see how his action cooperated with his faith and by his action faith found its full expression? So in this way the scripture was fulfilled because Abraham believed God 
His faith was exchanged for God's righteousness. So he became known as the lover of God. So, so now it's clear that a person is seen as righteous in God's eyes, not merely by faith alone, but by his works. And the same is true of the pro prostitute named Rahab, who was found righteous in God's eyes by her works. For re she received the spies into her home and helped them escape from the city by another route. For just as a human body without the spirit is a dead corpse so faith without the expression of good works is dead. So now I know this passage of scripture is referencing faith but I think discipleship is the same because unless there is fruit there is no discipleship right? And last week we talked about what that fruit of discipleship looked like right? I got a list for you love, joy peace Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and all of these are action. Right? Without works, there's no fruit. Even in the natural, energy is released for fruit to grow. So it is with discipleship. We know someone loves by the action they produce. Are you following me? We know someone uh, has joy by their actions. We know someone has peace by their actions. We know someone has patience by their actions. I cannot merely look at someone and know that they have the fruit of love. I mean, Caleb looks really lovely. But I can't look at him and see the love of God. No, I've got to, what? See it, right? Through what? Action. Practical discipleship is action. Practical discipleship takes action. With that in mind, what does practical discipleship look like? Well, we're going to start building. Yes, Lord. We're going to start building a list and most likely going to continue to build this list um, in the next week. But first, before we talk about what practical discipleship looks like, I want to take just a moment to build a list of what practical discipleship is not. Okay? Practical discipleship is not jealous. Practical discipleship is not boastful. It's not rude. Practical discipleship doesn't demand its own way. In other words, I take the first part of this list and I basically look at it and I say practical discipleship is not immature. Because all of those first few, what did I list? Four, five, whatever that number is. To me, they all sound to me like someone that just decided not to grow up. Sure. Yeah. Doesn't demand, practical discipleship does not demand its own way. Well, I'm going to take my ball and go home. Mm. You know what I look like this? You know what my mom used to say? Stick that lip out too much, bird's going to poop on it. No, this sounds like immaturity. It sounds like a little kid, doesn't it? Practical discipleship is not irritable. Practical discipleship keeps no record of being wronged. Man, I've talked to people that have gotten mad at me. And man, I get a whole list. And I'm like, oh, I pause. When was this? <laughs> I mean, it's happened so long ago, I forgot. I didn't say I didn't deny it. I just forgot. I didn't know what the heck they were talking about. Why? Because they had a list. They had a list. And they stored it right up here. And I feel like every time they saw my face, they, they attached me to that list. But you see, practical discipleship keeps no record of being wronged. Practical discipleship. Now, notice it doesn't he say here that it doesn't mean no one does you wrong. It just means it says we don't keep record of being wronged. Guess what? Somebody's going to do you wrong. I'm going to probably do you wrong. Because I'm human. I mess up. Now, if you know anything about me, I think the majority of you that know me would say, Kevin probably didn't do it intentionally. And that typically is, 
I think the majority of the time it's not intentional. But it still doesn't mean I won't do it. But we keep no record of being wrong. Practical discipleship does not rejoice about injustice. Practical discipleship never gives up. You're in it to win it. You're never going to give up. Practical discipleship never loses faith. So that's what practical discipleship is not. Now I want to start building this list on what practical discipleship is. And we're going to look at a few real quick in a list as well. Because what practical discipleship is, practical discipleship is patient. That's the one I had to learn. And still learning. Fishing with my dad taught me a lot of patience. Practical discipleship is patient. Practical discipleship is kind. I think we just should sit on that one the rest of the night because we live in a world that lacks a lot of kindness. Practical discipleship is kind. Practical discipleship rejoices whenever truth wins. Practical discipleship is always hopeful. And practical discipleship endures through every circumstance. Now the, this list of both what practical discipleship is not and what it is comes from one passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 from the New Living Translation says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So in summary of all that I've just said thus far, we could say practical discipleship is love. But I couldn't just leave it there. I couldn't just say that for a lot of reasons, which is why I broke this down in such detail because we have so meanings for love in the English language. One word, one simple little word, and yet we use the word to describe our feeling for pizza and our feelings towards our spouse of 30 years. This really isn't right. Because I sure hope I love my spouse of 30 years way more than I love pizza or we got... We got serious issues, Pastor Larry. But yeah, we use the same word to describe both. And I don't think it should be right. That, is, that just isn't right. In the Greek language, there is actually many words for love. Each carries a different significance. And the word love that we are speaking of in this text that we see here in 1 Corinthians 13 is actually speaking of, excuse me, <clears throat> Here is the word, the word agape. Agape. Now, this is why I brought this really thick book out. Rick Renner, who is a very schooled scholar in Greek in the New Testament, has this book called Sparkling Gems. If you've never read this book, you need to. It is good. It takes on just about, I think, at least one Greek word for every day of the year. So if you know no Greek, you can know 365 Greek words by the end of the year. But through this, there was a section here that I wanted to read where Rick talks about agape, love. And I'm just going to read, it. bear with me, it's a little bit, but I wanted you to see something that he portrays here of this one little word agape. Because we can say that agape is the God kind of love and you are true, that is correct. But I think you need more definition and more explanation to really understand what this word means. And I think Rick does a really good job of it. He's been talking about the different kinds of words for love, which there is eros, there's sturgo, there's phileo, and then there's agape, all describing a type or kind of love that we just all lump in together in one word. But the fourth word for love, Rick is saying here, is the word chiefly used in the New Testament to depict the love of God. This is the Greek word 
agape. And it is, and this, excuse me, and it is this word that Paul uses in Galatians 5.22 when he writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what I call high-level love, for there is no higher, finer, or more excellent love than agape love. In fact, the word agape is so filled with deep emotion and meaning that it is one of the most difficult words to translate in the New Testament. Trying to explain this word has baffled translators for centuries. Nevertheless, I will now add my attempt to clarify the meaning of this powerful word. Agape occurs when an individual sees, recognizes, understands, or appreciates the value of an object or a person, causing the viewer to behold this object or person in great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. Such great respect is awakened in the heart of the observer for the object or person he is beholding that he is compelled to love it. In fact, his love for that person or object is so strong that it is irresistible. In the New Testament, perhaps the best example of agape is found in a conversation, I might add, that Jesus is happy, having with a Greek scholar by the name of, I believe it was Simon, Simeon, Simon, I'm not sure exactly how that name is produced or, or made. In John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Shocker of a verse, isn't it? In the phrase, for God so loved the world, the word love is the word agape. This means when God looked upon the human race, he stood in awe of mankind, even though man was lost in sin. Now, the thing about this is that I hate is we take this short little three-letter word and lump it up into something that seems innate. Or, 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 or something we can't really understand fully. Because what really is sin? Well, I could read this. And it says, I could say that God, or this means that, um, that God looked upon the human race. He stood in awe of mankind, even though man was lost in lust. Lost in murder. Lost in treachery, in evil, in... Are you getting the idea in the picture? Think of what sin really is. Any mess up, mistake, screw up, that is what sin really is. So keeping that in mind, even though God looked on the human race and saw all of that murderers, thieves, liars, manipulators... Even though he saw that, God admired man. Just let that sink in. I mean, we see some of these headline newspapers of men that have done unspeakable things and wonder how their even own family could love them or stand beside them. And yet God looks down at all of those kinds of people and admired them. He wondered at man. He held mankind in the highest appreciation. Even though mankind was held captive by Satan at that moment, God looked upon the world and saw his own image. In man. The human race was so precious to God and he loved man so deeply that his heart was stirred to reach out and do something to save him. In other words, God's love drove him to action. You see, agape is a love that loves so profoundly that it knows no limits or boundaries in how far, wide, high and deep it will go to show the love to its recipient. If necessary, agape will love even, will even sacrifice itself 
for the sake of that object or person it so deeply cherishes. Agape is the highest form of love, a self-sacrificial type of love that moves the lover to action. In contrast, eros is a self-seeking love. Sturgo is a limited to only, one, only to one's family. Phileo is based on mutual satisfaction and can feel disappointed. Agape is a love that has no strings attached. It isn't looking for what it can get, but for what it can give. In awe of the one who has loved so deep that it is compelled to shower love upon the object or person regardless of the response. That is the profound love God has for the human race. For he loved man when he was still lost in sin with no ability to love him back. God simply loved mankind without any thought or expectation of receiving love in return. Now, there's another half of a page at least, if not more. I'm going to stop there. And what I loved the most about all of this was this one phrase that I think summarizes what we read very well in the sense that agape is a love that has no strings attached. This kind of divine love isn't looking for what it can get, but for what it can give. Agape is a love that makes no sense to the average human. Agape is the love that describes how God loves everyone regardless of what they have or have not done. I was exposed. Now, keep in mind, I know this is a movie. It is fictional. It is a view from actually an author of a book. But I've in the past and then most re or fairly recently rewatched the movie The Shack. And the part in that movie that I really thought of as I was studying out agape was the part in the movie where the Father God takes the man back to the place where his little girl was murdered by this man and shown by the father that he must forgive that man because God loves that man just as much as he loves him regardless of what that man did. That's love. In our natural minds, and when I saw that movie, it brought me to tears. I don't know any human being without having possession of the love of God in their heart could ever even understand that concept. That God would love the man who did who knows what to a little girl just as much as he loves me. That's agape. Because agape love looks past what we have done and sees who we really are. And I am convinced it's impossible for a human being to really understand that love without the love of God shed abroad in his heart. Now, don't really have scripture and verse to base my point of view, so I'm literally telling you, it's not a, a, a doctrine that we teach here at Family Church, it's just an opinion. But this is the kind of love that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about about agape loving people not for based on what they've done 
but loving people because of a God we know loves them just as much as he loves you and he loves me. Not based on what we have or have not done. Just because he looks on you with wonder and admiration because you were created in his very image. He made you. Regardless of what, whom, whoever may know of the bad that is inside of you, he sees and knows the good that's in you because he made it and put it there. And practical discipleship is looking past someone's faults and failures. Looking past preconceived ideas to see that kind of love that literally keeps no record of wrong. Even when the wrong is really, really bad. This is what it means to forgive deeply. To let God deal with that person or situation rather than letting it affect you or the feelings you have with that individual. This is why I can't understand church fights. Christians fighting against other Christians. I always think to myself, don't you know you are going to spend eternity with that person? I don't think they're going to be exclusion, exclusion, exclusion zones or restraining orders in heaven. When we truly follow Jesus, regardless of the wrong, we have to forgive and forgive deeply. I need to forgive in the same way I would want to be forgiven. We forgive not because anyone deserves it. It's because I've been forgiven when I didn't deserve it. When we truly follow Jesus, regardless of the wrong, we have to forgive. And when we do this, we set the example and precedent of how following Jesus really should be. Moving on, the next point of practical discipleship is practical discipleship lives out joy. Not fleeting joy or temporary happiness, I should say. Joy is that spirit-given expression that flourishes, flourishes best when times are strenuous, daunting, and maybe even outright tough. First Thessalonians 1 verse 6 says, And you became followers of my example in the Lord's when you received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit, even though it resulted in tremendous trials and persecutions. Remember, see, we, we think of the book of Acts and we think of all the miracles that happened that, you know, we even read, I don't know that this is Acts or another book in, in the Bible. I know the verse. I'm not sure where it is right off the top of my head because I didn't study it. But even Peter's shadow, right? As it passed by, people were healed. And we get excited. Some of us, we read these stories in here and we think, man, we want to live back then. Yeah, I want to live in the day where they had an underground church, where they, where they had to bury themselves in catacombs just to stay alive. You see, for, forget about that part. You were to reach back in church history. And I don't know that the church has seen the amount of persecution yet since that day. And yet, in that day, God's love and joy was poured out to so many in the midst of all the trials and those persecutions. That's joy. 
That's Holy Spirit given joy. This Greek, the Greek in this verse strongly implies that their supernatural joy was due to the Holy Spirit working on the inside of them. Joy is divine in nature, a fruit of the Spirit that is manifested in hard times. It's that exuberance that comes from knowing that even in the midst of the struggle, you are almost anticipating the turning point when God shows up to the scene and changes everything. How many have experienced those in your life? And you see, even we see back in Sarah and Abraham's life, how even in listed in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith that we often call that chapter, how Sarah looked back and saw how faithful God was through all of the persecutions and she believed God. It's almost that anticipation of knowing that God has been with me here and here and here and here. He is going to get me through this. I don't know how. I don't know when. It still hurts. It's still hard. Maybe the hardest thing you've ever been through. But it's that joy inside knowing. I can't wait to see God show up because I know he will. That's the joy. Joy comes <clears throat> when we refuse to dwell on the negative and instead trust and believe God that he will provide the way out just as he promised. And as we focus on loving the way God loves with agape love and as we set ourselves to trust God in the midst of the struggle and open the door for joy, I believe the natural step is peace. When you have that unending joy, when you know that you know that you know that God is in the middle with you, God is the fourth man in the fire, God is right there beside you. Come hell or high water. There's a peace that passes all understanding. And again, I believe this is, its origin is divine. Supernatural, but such a complete and total tranquility in our soul and in our spirit when we have heard from God and rest in his promises regardless of the chaos that may exist around us. This supernatural peace exists not on the basis of what we see, but on the basis of what God promised. Even when things may seem contrary. We see an example in the scripture of when Paul was taken to Rome by ship. And the captain had decided to set sail even against Paul's warning that the ship would be lost. When everyone was sure that they were all going to die, Paul was at peace because he had heard from the Lord. Acts 27 verse 22, but take courage. Did you hear that? They have thrown over cargo. They have thrown off the lifeboats. They have done everything they do, need to know to do. The ship is just driving them towards a reef to be smashed to pieces of which they're all going to die. And Paul says, take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship will go down. For last night an angel of the God, uh, angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. For you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. When you've come to rest on God's promises, and you've not let it move you, then peace can be the result. Now many things that I've talked about tonight are being an example of or are of supernatural 
in, in nature. But I want to be clear because just because the Holy Spirit divinely imparts joy and peace in our lives and I believe even is the instigator of stirring up the agape kind of love because I've stated before I don't believe someone without the love of God shed abroad in your hearts can love the way God loves. Even though these things are Holy Spirit and divine and supernatural imparted into us does not mean we cannot choose to not live this kind of joy and peace or exercise this kind of love in our lives. We most certainly can. We can quench this joy and peace if we entertain thoughts and motives and intentions contrary to the love of God. In so doing, we will not live joy and peace in our lives. Letting worry, letting strife dominate your thinking nullifies this fruit. But what an example. When we choose to take those thoughts captive and refuse to set our foot down, what a light to others. Even in the midst of the storms and chaos of life, we can sleep quietly on the back of the boat. Having fully embraced the love of God, trusting him, and the power of the Holy Spirit, letting this joy flood our hearts and quiet our minds with a peace that passes all understanding. Folks, when someone sees that, they can't help but see Jesus in you. They can't help but wonder, what is it that Steve's got? What is it? I want some of that. I think that's key to practical discipleship. We're going to continue to build on the list, but we're going to stop right there. When we... Okay, I lied. When we choose to exercise that kind of agape of love that looks beyond the sin in the sinner and sees the love and compassion that God has for that individual. That will get someone's attention and probably more than one. Would you agree? Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, for sowing it deep in our hearts. And Lord, I do believe as we live in a day where so many, so many are struggling and hurting, present company included, how even in the midst of those struggles, God, you've called us to meet other people's needs. That we can truly walk in the kingdom of God by being an example to others on how we walk. Not exempt from trials and tribulations, but almost immune. As if Water running off a duck's back. God, that's what you've called us to be. That's what you've called us to walk in. So God, I'm excited that as we begin to take you at your word and trust you in walking out that agape love in our lives to seeing the joy that comes only from you and the peace that passes all understanding. And having so many of those around us walking up asking, what is it that you have? That God being able to make disciples would just come so easy. 
God, that's my prayer for every person in this room tonight as we leave this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you got something out of it. We're going to continue talking next week, I believe. I think. It's normal Wednesday night on practical discipleship. I'm excited. Come back. Have a good night. You're dismissed.